We're back for your ears only. I'm Melissa Axelberth. I'm David Alpern with this quote from the news, a first step towards true democracy. That was Zhu Jianwan, a resident of the southern Chinese village of Wukan, where only two months ago villagers staged a bold protest against official corruption and chased away local leaders. Last week, the villagers voted for a committee to supervise future elections. Now this. I don't think these claims are new. These claims have been made for many, many years. And uh, we all know the reasons for that, because uh, we had a common agenda with most of the other players in the world many, many years back, and that doesn't seem to be leaving uh, us in terms of its, its effect. While we can't completely eliminate the potential for insider threats, we can greatly reduce them by using a multi-layered approach that includes smart vetting procedures, cultural training, leader and soldier force protection awareness, and counterintelligence counter efforts. Pakistan's foreign minister, Hina Rabbani Kar, came to Kabul last week, a gesture of solidarity, but with confusing denials of recent Taliban POW claims of support from Islamabad. And on Capitol Hill, U.S. Brigadier General Stephen Townsend had to explain the military's response to mounting losses inflicted by the very Afghan government forces that U.S. and NATO troops are fighting with and training. So many Americans were at least partially relieved to hear Defense Secretary Leon Panetta suggest that the U.S. combat role in Afghanistan Afghanistan would be scaled back to training only in 2013, a year before their scheduled exit. France has already talked about withdrawing early after losing troops to Afghan allies, and the U.S. is pursuing talks about talking with representatives of the Taliban leadership, even as the fight with their foot soldiers goes on. With some thoughts about possible strategies in Afghanistan and in Iraq, where U.S. troops have already left, for your ears only, we're joined again by Dr. Thomas Henriksen, senior fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution and the U.S. Joint Special Operations University, for which he's written about the policy he calls WHAM, Winning Hearts and Minds in Afghanistan and elsewhere. Welcome back to our program. Good morning. First, let's talk about what's happening on the ground in and around Afghanistan. What, what prospects do you see for talks with the Taliban that would bring them back into government uh, and end or greatly, greatly reduce insurgent violence, small unit attacks, suicide bombings? Well, I think the Taliban might come in or into talks with us, but there's going to be many problems, of course, with the Karzai government that, that feels it's being sidelined in these talks, and it wants its own separate talks. Uh, additionally, uh, there's a feeling among some of the Taliban that the, the talks are somewhat a cover, that they're going to take over anyway, but the United States is leaving. So uh, we have to, uh, the United States, that is, has to, in fact, uh, fight that feeling that we're pulling out uh, too quickly, and the Afghans will not be able to defend themselves. So there are a lot of sort of pieces to this puzzle that have to be put together. So just because there's talks beginning, uh, it's not, in fact, uh, clear how it's going to end. Do you see Afghan President Hamid Karzai really going along with a Taliban presence in his government or in particular regions? Well, he said in the past that, you know, there's room for everyone in this government, but by that he means that the, the Taliban must lay down their arms and join his government. So it's going to be very difficult for him to, in fact, see them part of a government, and it will awaken certain splits within the country itself, because the Taliban are largely, but not exclusively, part of the Pashtun people in the south, and that leaves other ethnic groups wondering. So it's not just Taliban versus Karzai, it's Taliban versus other ethnic communities and in a very fractured society. How worried are you by the mounting toll on allied forces by the government troops with which they're working? And do you see it as Taliban or al-Qaeda infiltration, inspiration, or a more basic clash of cultures uh, between supposed allies? The so-called green on green is where the military phrases that, uh, <laughs> the military being blue, but these attacks being among ourselves. They're quite worrisome because I think they undermine certain morale among the soldiers and Marines and NATO forces themselves that who they can trust and who they can work with. Now, many of the attacks have been uh, personal grudges, not just infiltration of a Taliban or a Taliban wearing uniforms. But there again, it does lead to certain uncertainty. And the French were certainly taken back when four of their soldiers were killed a few weeks ago and led to the French announcing, uh, in part, uh, to their withdrawal in 2013. So it is a problem. And it, it, it's not easy to manage. It's one that we, the United States and its NATO allies have to work on. But it's not clear, again, whether it can be stopped. 
In your essay on winning hearts and minds, you note it has long been a useful tactic in war zones, but that, as currently practiced by Washington, it's more like nation building and just too expensive to endure. Give us some numbers. Well, th- that is true. I mean, the very fact that we're spending billions of dollars uh, in Afghanistan, roughly $100 billion a year, and, and the total cost of the war is soon going to approach that of uh, Iraq, it's terribly expensive. The hearts and mind concept, briefly, is that you win over people to your side, and not only do you win them over to your side, but they connect them to their government. That's the vital part that most people leave out. It's not just that Americans are considered good guys in a war zone, but they can somehow connect these people in villages and rural areas to their own government. That's extremely tough to do. It sounds easy, but it take, it's very, very hard to do. And that is a key ingredient, not just infrastructure building of, of, of highways and hospitals and police academies and so on. Well, it depends on the nature of the government itself, and uh, we've many times expressed doubts about Karzai and who he's really working with and for uh, besides himself. Absolutely. Uh, if a government is distrusted or is considered con- corrupt or, or, or whimsical or, or considered, in fact, an enemy of the people in the village, that breaks that vital link that has to be established between people and their government. And, and that is a worrisome factor, uh, as you indicated, with Karzai, and it's been so for quite some time. The administration is downplaying Panetta's remarks about pulling back from combat a year before total pullout. What's your view? Well, I, th- I think there, that's already, we've already, the United States has already turned over certain areas to local commanders, particularly in the north where it's safer, and that will continue. It's going to be a trial and error process. I think it's hard to lie down, uh, lay down markers and say, yes, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. It's going to be hard. We're going to have to try to stand up an army that can fight, has a confidence, and also has the coherence and logistical support to fight the Taliban. That is not easy. It's not, a, not just a question of lack of bravery. It's a question of organization. And so there'll be some mistakes made uh, as we go forward in this process, but it's clear that the United States and its allies have announced that they're going to pull out uh, by 2014. So the process has to begin. You've also written that Obama withdrew troops from Iraq too soon, though many Americans may be relieved our guys are not caught up in the increasingly bloody ethnic divisions and power plays there. Or do you see GIs able to keep a lid on that? Well, I think uh, a a fair number, they had it would have been 10 to 20,000 troops in Iraq who could have kind of from behind the scenes helped to... Uh, the Iraqi forces in combating particularly al-Qaeda elements that are still still active in the country. And I think it was a loss of leverage. Uh, my own belief is we, we should have perhaps put troops into Kurdistan in the north. We had a long attachment with them. Uh, the Kurds were very pro us. There was relatively little violence against us. And I think it would have helped our leverage in the Middle East as we begin to pull out of Afghanistan. Thomas Henriksen, Senior Fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution and the U.S. Joint Special Operations University. Quote from the news, those are the real heroes. That was Angel Fernandez Chavera of mainly Hispanic St. Rose of Lima Catholic Church in East Haven, Connecticut, after about 100 Latino congregants came forward to document local police harassment and violence. Despite risks of reprisal, four officers were arrested on federal charges of conspiracy, false arrest, excessive force, and obstruction of justice. And police chief Leonard Gallo announced his early retirement. Next, danger seen from Davos and Brussels for your ears only.